No, it doesn't look like it. Oh, geez, that was a huge bug. I digress. I know it doesn't look like it, but my property, it's an absolute mess right now. This last week, we had some serious temperatures here in central Iowa. Every day of the week was over 100 degrees, actual temperature, like 103, 105, and it felt like 115 or 116 degrees by the time we factored in the humidity. And that fell at a perfect time because Nava and I just celebrated our anniversary, so we headed off to the Mississippi River, so I've been gone all week during this extreme heat, and the, the yard and the weeds definitely did not settle down by any means. So before we get to work on anything too serious, we need to get the lawn mowed. Definitely need to do some weed whacking. We need to get all this picked up. We need to spray the edge of the driveway for encroaching weeds. I've got not one, but seven loads of three inch rock that I need to get spread out over here and down there. And while I was gone, the dumpster guys came, they emptied that bad boy out. So we got a little bit more we gotta throw in there. And then we got all that as well. So we're just gonna call today a good old welcome back home call. Let's do some property maintenance. So per the usual, we are having a slight little change of plans. I need to run down to the quarry and grab a sample of some limestone so that I can send it off to a lab. They're talking rain for the next hour, actually. So we're going to, how would that be? You make hay while the sun shines. What do we do while it rains? We drive to the quarry. Welcome to the quarry, the land of the giant piles of rock. Holy smokes, I could use all that three inch over there. I think that's the pile that we're looking at right there of getting a sample from. Big old white mountain. Look at all that rock. They got it all in different sizes and different piles. Look at how the rain has just eroded that over time. I, mean, I definitely don't need that much. We're just getting about a third of a bucket full. We got plenty more if we need more. Wow. So this is the white lime right here. And then it appears like that dark pile over there, that's the dark lime. That's what we were getting before. And I guess this is a new thing. I, I just learned about this. Ugh. So as you know, I like to find problems and then I like to figure out how to fix those problems so that way we don't have those problems anymore. And then we have a whole different new set of problems. So last year after harvest, I took soil samples. We took 400 acres and we soil sampled every single individual acre on those 400 acres. And then our other 1600 acres we have on two and a half acre grid samples. So that means every two and a half acres, we took a soil sample. And that basically paints a picture of our fields to determine what has good fertility, what does not have good fertility. Maybe we have good fertility in this spot, but it's lacking this. And the whole foundation of us being able to fix that fertility is based on the acidity or the alkalinity of our soil. We have really acidic soils because when we put nitrogen on and we don't put anything to buffer that acidity, basically we pump a bunch of hydrogen ions into the soil. And the more hydrogen that's in something, the more acidic it is. So we have soils that are over 100 times more acidic than they should be. So they need to be corrected before we can correct any other part of fertility in our soil. And that comes through calcium carbonate, which is this, ag lime, literally crushed limestone. It's just, it's a powder. So last year we made an application of calcium carbonate, but it was not this particular crushed limestone. This is kind of the consistency of sand. So there are some bigger chunks of crushed limestone in there. And then there's pieces that are extremely fine. So basically we took an ag lime and they took all the little pieces like this out, filtered them out. And then we were left with just the finest powder of the finest powder known to mankind, literally like flour. And then they take a syrup of some sort and they roll it together in a big old rock tumbler and it turns into little pellets. They call that pelletized lime or pell lime for short. When we have a big chunk of limestone just like this, this is not reactive with the soil whatsoever because it doesn't break down. We literally need the limestone to dissolve into the soil in order for it to bind to the hydrogen ions in the soil and then therefore flush them down through the bottom of the soil. And it, it basically turns into the same product as milk of magnesia. So we have some bigger chunks of stuff in this. We have smaller chunks. That means this particular ag lime is not immediately reactive and how reactive is it? I really don't know. So that's why 
we grabbed a sample because we are going to send these things off to the lab so that way we'll get an actual analysis of how quick will this break down and also what is the mineral breakdown of it how much calcium is in this how much magnesium is in this basically that's going to give us an equation on exactly how much we need to put onto our fields in order to correct them based on the soil samples that we took. Wait up a second. If we just put Pell Lime on last year to get a quick reaction to fix the pH in our soils, what in the world are we looking at a sample of Ag Lime for for this next year? Well, first off, I don't know fully how corrected our soils are. We were pretty jacked up. We had some stuff in the low four pHs and we wanna be like mid sixes. So we were really low and it takes quite a bit of lime to get us to that point. And frankly, I don't know if we got enough on last year. So we may need more to fix some more pH spots, but we need to get retested first before we know that. Secondly, Lime does more than just affect the pH. It also affects something called the base calcium saturation. Imagine you open up a bag of M&Ms, you dump it out on the table, and you separate out all the individual colors into their own pile. After you get done getting them in their own groups, you count them. There's 100 M&Ms. 60 of them are blue, 20 of them are red, 10 of them are green, and 10 of them are yellow. So that means 60% of the M&Ms in the bag were blue. That is the base saturation of blue M&Ms in the bag. Since 20% of the M&Ms were red, that means the base saturation of red M&Ms was 20%. So our soil works the exact same way. If we take a handful of soil and we separate out all the individual elements in the soil into their own individual piles, and we add that up as a whole, and then we take whatever one we're looking for, in this case, calcium, and we do that as a percentage of the whole what's in the handful of soil, that is the base saturation. So how many blue M&Ms do we have in our soil? That's what we're looking for, and that's what we're trying to fix. Because right now, we only have 40 blue M&Ms in our bag of M&Ms. So how do we get more M&Ms? Well, we call up the quarry and we say, hey, do you have any more blue M&Ms that I could buy? And then you put them on your pile, then boom, base saturation fixed. One time my grandpa told my neighbor that I was an old man stuck in a child's body when I was a little boy. I'm that excited about ag line. That just, that just gets me going. That is so fascinating to me. <laughs> okay, let's get to work. Hmm, the old mother groundhog is back. I'm gonna get you. Huh. Yeah, that's what I thought. By the way, everything we just talked about applies to your garden. So if you feel like you're not producing the things you should be producing in your garden, get a soil sample. Take a look. We're not very far in, we're already starting to sweat through the pants. We're pretty dirty. Hey buddy, what are we doing? You've been practicing your ninja moves? Ooh, check this out. Bam, got you right in the eyeball. Bam. <laughs> I got everything mowed down around underneath the bend site and we got everything weed whacked that needs to be done. Cooper said he was planning on mowing the yard in the morning. I don't know how he does it, but that boy can do some auto steer lines with the lawnmower. So we're gonna let him do the main front yard because he can make it look better than I can. But farm side mode what I should do is get a little saw and cut off the limbs of this. I have cut this tree literally like five times down to the stump. The tree died years ago. And then I trimmed everything up and then now it just keeps coming back. Buddy, I just want to go to bed. Oh, the weather today is so much nicer than it's been all week. I think 84 is the high today. It's like 74 degrees outside right now and we have a breeze. I almost want to put a jacket on. We are going to spread rock on the other side of the big machine shed, but we're going to make ourselves do the not fun job first, which is getting all of this trash and all of that trash in the dumpster. <laughs> I decided to change up my plans a little bit. I filled the dumpster and then realized, yeah, there's actually a fair bit of metal here. 
So we're just gonna load everything up into the dump truck and take this to the scrap yard and then the trash that's in this pile will go in the dumpster. Which is probably what you're supposed to do in the first place, but it's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission, right? Yeah, you showed up just in time. Just in time for you to load up some old junk. Yeah, we decided that we should put it in the dump truck instead of the dumpster. Actually have a pretty decent load in there. Last thing, we gotta cut up these old field cultivator springs. The scrap yard doesn't like it when you bring stuff in with a spring on it. They put it in their crusher or something where to break, a spring can go flying out. So we're just gonna take this little, hopefully that blade's good enough to do this. We're just gonna put a slit in these springs to cut them. So then that way they're limp. Let's take a moment to mentally prepare. It's time to spread the rock! <coughs> oh, that came out funny. It's time to spread the rock! We made the best driveway in the world and it just so happened to be my driveway! We're not gonna get semis stuck through here anymore. We're actually gonna be able to drive through this. We're gonna be able to drive around the corner without getting stuck. And we're gonna be able to drive down there, make the turn to come up under the overhead and onto the pit without getting stuck. Look into my driveway and it's easy to see. All right, vamanos, let's get these seven loads of rock spread. Each one of these is like 19 tons, so we got some spreading to do. And this is also gonna be Edward's first job driving the skid loader. He's ridden in with dad before, but today it's gonna be put to work. Tried putting little sunglasses on Edward. He did not like that. He kept ripping them off. We tried putting earmuffs on him. He didn't like those either. <laughs> Kept ripping them off. Put the sun hat on him. He doesn't seem to mind that. We just about got it whacked off. We're gonna need more rock. We got everything from that little building down to the edge of the field yet to do. But we made progress, look at all that. Now I guess I have family pictures to go to, so I should probably go get cleaned up so number one, Neva doesn't slice me open and number two, so my mom doesn't beat me up. You hey, look stay. enthusiastic, stay. Okay. This is my second day. evening of being photographed. Oh so. my. Cooper, you look like a frat boy. I know, I told you. Okay, let's think about this a little bit. This is how much rock we have left. We need to get more ordered. I'm guessing there's probably gonna be about four more loads down there. This is probably like a half a load. Number one, while we're at it and everything is loose and has not been packed down, I'm gonna get this all smoothed out and we're gonna pack it with the skid loader before we absolutely do anything. I've learned over time laying rock down, if you say you're gonna get it smoothed out and then you just leave it and it's rough and then it gets driven on, it gets rained on, it kind of settles its way down, then the driveway is just going to perpetually be bumpy unless we actually get a land plane in there to smooth it off, which we don't have a land plane, so that could be a while. So we're just gonna smooth it out first thing. Over the past couple years, I've had a fair bit of experience laying down some rock and I'm starting to develop what is working and what is not. Bigger rock is more difficult to spread than small rock, but the good news is it's rock. If we make a mistake, we can fix it. We ended up laying the rock down parallel to the direction the building is running. And we started at that end and we worked our way this way. So we ended up running over rock we already applied as we were doing that. And that helped us develop where the low spots were and where the high spots were. So now we're coming in at a 45 degree angle to how we laid the rock. And we're just tipping the bucket down and we're just lightly back grading everything and then we're going to end up hitting it at this angle now. We're just backing up nice and easy. I probably put maybe a hundred pounds worth of force down on the ground. We're not trying to dig down to the dirt. We're just trying to smooth out the high spots and fill in the low spots. It's doing a really nice job. Now we're on the fun part. We got a full bucket of rock. So that way we got some extra weight and we're literally just gonna keep driving back and forth. We started the building, 
And then every time we make a pass, we scoot over 12 inches and we keep doing that until we've done the entire thing. Big thing that I've found to be a key player when we have the tracks, I've tried just running over before and it didn't do a very good job. Fill the bucket with rocks. Oh man, it makes a huge difference. Just look at this. We've ran over this part. We'll go right to the line. That part's been ran over. See how smooth that is? And then right over here, that has not been ran over yet. So when you walk on that, it feels like you're about to break your ankle just falling inside of all these holes. This is extremely loose, big old chunks. And then we come over here to where it's been packed in. This is really nice. Look, you can see the line. Top part, wherever my finger is at, top part is not ran over, bottom is. Probably end up taking that half a load of rock and just getting it set in here right now. I would really like to start doing some fine trim work around the edge of this bend and underneath the stairs going up. Thing is, I have a full week this week and I'm not gonna be able to get out to work on this for a few days. We need to get all this mowed down with the weed whacker before we leave and we also need to get it sprayed and we also need to get the, the edges of the driveway sprayed where weeds are starting to creep in. So we're gonna take easy way with skid loader so that way we can get everything done before it gets dark. I was today years old when I learned that when your wire gets a little short, you just smack it on the ground while it's running and it auto puts out what you need. For the last two years, every single time my stuff got short, I had to take the end piece off, rewind everything back out, pull it out, use wire cutters. Absolute pain. Game changer. natural habitat when he's not, when he doesn't know he's being filmed. Let's find out. Let's see. I don't want to sneak up on him because <laughs> he's weed whacking and that might not be good. But look at guys. That is what he's doing when he's not being filmed. He's working! What a shock! I was incorrect. He is being filmed. <laughs> and we've been spotted. We've been spotted. I have run out of gas. Okay, where is the gas container? It's supposed to have a 50-50 mix. I'm buying a little push mower because that is not fun. I've been weed whacking for an hour and a half. I'm still not done. Cooper doesn't know where the gas can is. Dad doesn't know where the gas can is. So I'm just gonna use the old trusty electric one. Oh, I got dark quick. Okay, we got everything weed whacked. We just need to grab the leaf blower and those hay bales smell like chocolate. Hmm, that smells kind of weird. But we're gonna grab the leaf blower, blow off all the concrete of all the stuff we just weed whacked. And then in the morning, we'll get out the sprayer. We'll spray all the weed whacking areas. That way we'll be able to just get the lawnmower right up to everything again. And then we won't have to weed whack anymore, which will be pretty nice. Oh man, that's annoying. We got three things in here. We got two contact killers and then a residual herbicide. Residual is the absolute key for spraying the driveway because if you just have contacts in, you only kill the stuff that's green, but then the new stuff that comes and grows through, nothing stops that. The residual herbicide we have in here, that's where that comes into play. It wiggles through the rock, gets down on the soil, and then it says to the newly germinating stuff, uh-uh, you're not coming up out of the ground. That has been game changer when I started implementing that. It's a little challenging to film with a gloved up spray hand, but from the edge of the concrete out in that weed whacked area, we got all that sprayed. So now we'll be able to come on this particular spot with the lawnmower and not have to do any weed whacking at all. We did under all the auger loadouts, so that way weeds aren't growing up around them. And then all of the sidewalk on both sides, around the electrical stuff, around the dryer, around the LP tanks, 
everything. We've identified one of the most time consuming things about maintaining our property has been the weed whacking. So that is kind of where the spraying around stuff is going to come into play. Down the road, once this whole fiasco is figured out, we'll probably end up just rocking through there, just like everything else over here. And then it'll be pretty stinking easy to maintain, just spray it once a month, basically, on the little ones that have came through, and, and we won't have any problems at all. But we don't know when that's gonna fully be resolved yet. So for the meantime, this is what we're doing. We have to go back on our word a little bit here from that brown piece of tin over. We got everything here smooth, it's packed, this is fully ready to go. We got that much rock left. We do not have time to get that spread. We also do not have time to go from there down to the end of the building. We got that smooth, but we don't have time to get it packed. A little crop update. We have been dry basically just like the rest of the United States of America. We have been a little more fortunate though. We've gotten a few more timely rains than I would say most areas around us. So stuff's looking pretty good here. I know I drive 30 minutes one way or 30 minutes the other, you get into some spots where stuff's starting to burn up because it's pretty dry, but we have not experienced any of that yet. When we've been digging graves, we've had moisture down in the ground, so we, the moisture is there. It's not as dry as it has been. I'd say it's similar to what we had last year, if not maybe even a little bit more moisture than we had last year, and we had pretty good crops last year, so we're optimistic about that. We're out here at Tabletop right now. We do not have any yellowing going on in any of our beans, so nothing is starting to change to the north, to the south. I have noticed a little bit of some color changes in spots, but these are also a later maturity soybean for the area. These are a 3-0. The longest we planted is a 3-3. The shortest we planted this year was a 2-2, I believe. So we're pretty full season on the soybeans. Looking at these plants here, I'm pretty happy with what I'm seeing. A lot of three pods, I haven't seen any four pods, but I'm not really seeing any two pods, which the two and one potters are what seem to rob a lot of yield. The pods that set first were the ones in the bottom of the plant. These ones are nice and round. These are going to be our heaviest beans. And then as we work our way up the plant, we are going to get to the lighter beans because those are just now starting to fill out. They're much flatter than the ones on the bottom. So that's why a late August, early September rain can be so beneficial for soybeans because that allows nutrients and moisture to get up into the top third of the plant, which can really boost the yield. So a rain right now while these are still alive would be greatly appreciated. We would more than welcome it. But that's kind of what we're looking at with soybeans right now. It, Pretty happy with what we're seeing. Whenever I pull plants, I like to walk out into the field a little ways. I get off the end rows. These are not a good representation of the field on the edge. But on both of these plants, both of them have a majority three potters. This one only had four two potters and it had one one potter. The rest were all three potters, which that is absolutely fantastic. That's what we like to see. And this one, the trend seems to be a common thing. We got a two potter on the bottom, but looking at all these others, there's a one potter right there. One potter meaning there's only one bean inside of it and three pod meaning there's three inside of it. You can see the little bumps, but I have not seen any fours yet, but nice clustering. I'm happy with how these beans are looking. Little trick I learned watching the internet. If you want to identify diseases in a leaf better, when you're looking at this, it's kind of hard to tell. You can see a couple lesions, but when you hold it up to the sun, Where's the sun at? And you look at it through the sun, then it really shows all the little spots and the imperfections of the leaf. So, a little pro tip right there. If you want to see diseases you couldn't see before, just put it, the sun behind it. And this one right here actually has a little bit of white mold going. So, that's not what we like to see. I'm not seeing it on this other one. So, hopefully that's the only plant in the field that has it. <laughs> as far as estimating yield on the soybeans, it is so difficult. When it comes to corn, you can grab an ear and you can do a simple math calculation and get a rough idea of kind of what you're looking at. But beans, you just don't know. You can count pods, you can count beans on a plant, you can do what you want, but are you gonna have 1,800 beans per pound? Or are you going to have 2,900 beans per pound? 3,400 beans per pound? It, I don't know, if you have 1,800 and 3,600, that is literally half the yield on the 3,600 versus the 1,800 with the identical amount of beans. So we can just look at it. What do we have for disease? Is stuff filling out nice? We'll know when we combine it. Question everybody's been dying 
to know how is the intercrop corn looking on this end we have our 12 rows of beans 12 rows of corn as we work our way down we go six and six eight and eight four and four three and three two and two and then by the trees we have one and one one of the challenges with intercropping is the fact that we have to use chemistry to control our weeds that can be sprayed on both corn and soybeans now traditionally the stuff you spray on beans is not good for corn and the stuff you spray on corn is not good for beans. So the stuff that we had to use kind of is more or less a jack of all trades. So it doesn't really have a master on either or. So the performance we got out of the chemistry was, uh, we'll call it mediocre. We definitely have some breakout spots. This is a lower weed pressure field, but I'd call 90% of the field clean. The other 10%, Definitely we have our fair share of water hemp. I know next time I end up doing this I am going to up the rates of what I was using. I think I was a little bit on the lighter end And also hopefully next time I use this they have new chemistry that allows us to spray stronger stuff on both corn and soybeans Which it sounds like that's coming. The edge of the field is definitely the worst when it comes to our weed pressure But there are a few pockets like this as you go up the rows of beans. Before I jump into the intercrop stuff and see how it is actually looking, as far as the corn goes, this year during pollination we had a lot of heat and some of our corn pollinated just before the heat, some pollinated during the middle of the heat, and some pollinated after the heat. The stuff that was after the heat got a nice rain with it, so that pollination is beautiful. Honestly, the stuff that pollinated during the heat and before the heat looks really good too. At least what I've been in so far, I'm pretty impressed with how the crops were able to handle it despite having 104 degrees for four days during the middle of pollination and we hadn't had rain for like two and a half weeks. Shortly after pollination came through, we did get hit with some 70 mile an hour winds or so. Originally, I thought 90, like six miles away, got clocked with 90. The town, a couple miles away, got clocked with mid 80s. And we got it a little less, so we're just gonna call it 70s. But it definitely did do some tattering of the corn. We got some shredded up leaves on the edges of fields. And then anything that was planted north and south kind of got laid over a little bit. So that would be like Uncle Orland's around Dad's house and grandpa's here as far as disease is looking this is from the lower part of the canopy and this is the ear leaf the lower part of the canopy we definitely have some more serious tar spot coming in there's a lot bigger lesions big old cluster of it right there and then we're getting some deficiencies i take it that is a nitrogen deficiency which makes sense on the lower part of the plant this time of the year it's starting to work its way from the bottom up so we, we should see that natural senescing of the plant here pretty soon. But as far as the tar spot goes on these lower leaves compared to a higher leaf, this is the ear leaf here, which is more the middle of the plant, we have a whole lot less. So those are big pieces there, are tar spot lesions. And the rest of this is just dead pollen. We have a lot of rain to wash it off since it pollinated. But there is definitely significantly less tar spot. And this is our most important leaf. So we want to keep this guy as healthy as possible. If we hold it up to the sun, it's going to reveal a lot more. I'm not really seeing much other disease. Those little things may be something. I'm not really sure what that is. I'm not seeing any gray leaf spot, I don't think. Or northern corn leaf blight. So as far as health wise, See some tar spot and that's about it, at least on this leaf. Yeah, look at all that tar spot on this lower leaf. Wow, it's a good amount. Tar spot's kind of a, a buzzword, I guess you could say, in the agriculture community right now. It is a relatively new disease. Apparently it came from Mexico in 2017 was when it was first discovered. And from my understanding, there's no cure for it. It's more of a preventative measure. And this particular leaf had two passes of fungicide on it. And this is a relatively tar spot resistant hybrid and we still have it here so haven't quite figured out the secret to it yet but I've seen it much much worse than what we're looking on this leaf from my understanding the way it works is wherever there's a lesion from there to the tip on the particular vein that it is on in the leaf is shut down and it shuts it down in basically two weeks it kills it so you don't want to get it at the base of the leaf because then from there all the way out on that vein 
to shut down. So we just have it on the tip right here and hopefully it stays there. I've also heard of people talking about they maybe think there's two different types of tar spot because some years when it comes in, it seems like it kills the plant just absolutely dead as can be. And then other times you just get these lesions and then they just kind of stay like that and it doesn't really seem like they do a whole lot, at least to the physical appearance of the leaf. As far as the intercrop goes, let me uh, point out the elephant in the room quick. I agree. I think this is going to be an absolute pain in the butt to harvest, especially when we get to our narrower row configurations. We are going to be sacrificing some beans. So the idea is we're going to come in and we're going to combine the corn first, and then we'll come in and do the beans. So the beans are going to be a little sacrificial from a they're being shaded out perspective as well as they're getting hit with trash when they're dry and beans are probably going to fall out onto the ground so we're kind of getting a bit of a double whammy but we're trying to prove a proof of concept here i've been hearing a lot of really impressive things when it comes to intercropping so you never know unless you try it on your own farm that's the attitude i've been trying to take towards it so we're, we did 27 acres of corn like this and 27 acres of beans so we're gonna see. You know when you're driving down the road and you're looking at the field from the edge and you just see all of these monstrosity ears on here and oftentimes there's two of them. And so then we think the entire field is like that when in most fields, practically 99.9% .9 of fields, there's only one ear of corn and the edge looks the very best because it has access to the most important resource for plants the sun. Is that my row? That is touching the beans. We planted at almost twice the normal population that we plant. And then the next one in, we planted at a higher population, but a little bit less than the outside one. And then the next one in, we went a little bit less population. And then everything inside of that, we've just planted at a normal population. Basically, the ones that are closer to the edge, they get more sunlight. We just planted them thicker. So that way we can get more bigger ears more double ears. Just for a little reference, this was an ear that I pulled about 100 feet into the field. Really nice ear. I just picked a random one. And then I picked a random one from the edge of the field. So we already got quite the size difference and that's not really the full story with the edge of the ear field because there was also this ear on the same plant. So basically we have almost twice the yield from one plant being on the edge of the field. So when we plant the edge ones at twice the population and we get two times as many years theoretically we should get I don't know the math there but we should get a lot more yield we're going to be losing some of the soybeans so we need the corn to make up for it but that's kind of intentional but that's the idea behind it if we can get this every single plant at a higher population versus this on every single plant at a lower population but we're losing a little bit on the beans to get this which hopefully the second guy makes up for it. That's why we're doing it. We're gonna to try to prove the proof of concept because at the end of the day, the dollar and cents behind it is what is going to be the determining factor of if we do it or not, because this is a whole lot easier to do than this. <laughs> Fun fact, if you ever wanna know what the corn you're holding is going to yield, just take it, count how many kernels long and count how many kernels around. In this case, this one is 40 kernels long and it's 16 kernels around. We're gonna multiply that number together and then we're gonna multiply that number by the population. How many plants per acre? So in this case, we're 32,000 plants per acre. So we're gonna multiply 16 times 40 times 32. And then we're gonna divide that by how many kernels or in a bushel. So we're gonna take 85,000 kernels for this example. We're on the little conservative side because we're a little early. We can divide it by 80 if we want to. But 16 by 40 times 32 divided by 85, we have a 240 bushel per acre ear. Of course, that's assuming every single ear in the field is going to be exactly the size and that there's always 32,000 plants per acre in the field. Some ears are gonna be bigger than this, some are gonna be smaller. It gives us a rough idea. And you're not fooling me. I know how it works. Everybody goes along and they're like, I want to grab the gargantuan one like that. But we know there's these out in the field. You got to count those two. Ooh. Ooh, we're like half milk line too. Wow. You can see the white line where it meets the yellow. That's what they call the milk line. It'll work its way down as it becomes more mature. So once we get down here, it'll be three quarter. Once it gets all the way to the red part on the bottom, 
Then we've reached black layer, aka physiological maturity. At that point, the center cob will stop supplying nutrients out to the individual kernels, and then these will start to dry down and we will be ready to harvest. This particular cornfield is at 108 day. It's gonna take 2,620 GDUs, at least according to the tech sheet from Champion Seed. This is Champion 58A21. It's gonna reach physiological, physiological maturity at 2,620 GDUs. Right now, this field's sitting at right at 2,300 GDUs. So if we collect like 20 to 25 a day, it, this field will reach physiological maturity in about 16 to 17 days. Ooh, I was supposed to leave an hour ago for the Farm Progress Show. So we're gonna be asking for some forgiveness. <laughs> But that is how our beans are looking. That is how our corn is looking. We would gladly take a rain, but what we get is what we get. And for the conditions we've had this year, stuff is looking better than it should. We've had some pretty incredible support on farmfocus.com. The link is also in the description on our merch. So thank you for to everybody who has been representing Cornstar Farms. If you don't have a shirt yet or a hat or socks or anything else on the site, check out the link in the description or right here on the bottom of the screen. Type it in. It'll take you right there. But that is all I have for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. It means a lot to all of us. We'll see you in the next one.